Today I'm going to talk about another topic that's been done to the death before. The greenhouse effect and climate change. You've all heard the same slogans over and over. Sun heats the earth. The earth cools by emitting electromagnetic waves. CO2 in the atmosphere reabsorbs these waves and keeps the earth warm in the manner of a greenhouse, altering the global climate, blah, blah, blah. But what I want to focus on are some simple, fundamental principles to explain the greenhouse effect in a broad, general, big picture, intuitive way. And the first important concept is the conclusion of my video on the electromagnetic spectrum and quantum mechanics. The big picture major point there was the relationship between processes and matter and the frequencies of light that induce them upon emission or absorption. The equation E equals HF can relate a frequency of light emitted or absorbed, F, to a particular process in matter with energy E. Recall also the broader significance of this is that classically we can understand that different regions of the electromagnetic spectrum, different colors, exist and are emitted or absorbed in different processes, but we don't have an explanation for why that is, and quantum mechanics gives us that why. There I also spoke about how thermal energy, random energy that a system has simply because it's not at absolute zero, fits in with our E equals HF law. And the way that worked was that the equation that kt is approximately equal to e allows us to estimate the random thermal energy that a system has based on the temperature t and tells us in light of e equals hf that because this system has random energy e it's also going to be randomly emitting or absorbing light in general the light emitted due to random thermal processes will span a broad spectrum but the peak of that spectrum, the largest amount of energy emitted, will be at a frequency such that the photon energy HF is approximately equal to a constant of order 1 times the random thermal energy KT. The source of energy for the greenhouse effect is the sun. And this equation, A KT, A being our constant of order 1, AKT equals HF allows us, knowing the peak frequency of sunlight, to derive the temperature of the sun. The peak frequency of sunlight is in the yellow, giving a temperature at the surface of the sun of 5,778 Kelvin. Now that energy of sunlight being mostly in the visible is, as we learned, fine-tuned to the energy differences of electron states and matter, particularly large molecules. Our atmosphere, of course, contains matter, but it's mostly small molecules, O2, N2, CO2, water, H2O. These diatomic and triatomic molecules are too small to have electron energy states that correspond to visible photon energies. That's why the atmosphere is transparent. Light goes right through it. The atmosphere being transparent is just another way of saying that it's not absorbing the sun's energy. More complex forms of matter, larger molecules, on Earth do, however, which is why, of course, they are in general opaque. Having concluded that in general the atmosphere is not absorbing the sun's light, while matter on Earth is, we need in addition to the precise spectrum of frequencies in sunlight, the overall total quantity of radiated energy from sunlight hitting Earth's surface. And on a clear day, that energy, more specifically that intensity, is about a thousand watts per square meter. An object a square meter in size that can absorb all the sun's rays on a clear sunny day in one second absorbs a thousand joules of energy. How much energy is a thousand joules? See the link slide at the bottom for real world comparisons of energy values. A thousand watts per square meter is the amount hitting a portion of the Earth's surface on a clear sunny day, which is of course not always the case. But if we average over the entire Earth, taking into account variations of sunlight throughout the day and year, the average intensity hitting the Earth is about 230 watts per square meter. And that's the more useful figure that we'll use. That energy starts to heat up the object, let's say the Earth's surface in general now, according to its heat capacity, a measure of how much temperature changes based on changes in energy. So the sun's rays are hitting the surface of the Earth, warming it up, but we also know that at the same time, because Earth is not at absolute zero temperature, it's also emitting electromagnetic radiation. And now we can introduce a new equation. 
The total intensity of radiation due to thermal radiation, that is, radiation due to the random motion of the system that it has because it is not at absolute zero temperature, that total intensity of thermal radiation is equal to a constant times temperature to the fourth power. Sometimes that's multiplied by a number less than one called the emissivity to account for variations in which frequencies can be emitted. To change from intensity to power in units of watts, we multiply by the surface area of the object, the whole Earth in this case. This strongly nonlinear dependence means that at low temperatures, radiation is negligible, but it increases extremely rapidly as temperature increases. By the way, the total radiated power doesn't tell you if you can see this radiation. For that, we still only care about the spectrum of radiation, with the peak at HF equals to a constant A times KBT, if that includes visible radiation. The change of thermal energy of the object, the random energy characterized by the temperature, that change of thermal energy of an object is equal to the energy absorbed from the sun minus the energy released. The change of thermal energy is heat capacity C times M the mass times change of temperature as before, but let's convert that to a time rate of change by making the delta capital T into a derivative of capital T temperature with respect to little t time. The input of energy is the intensity times the surface area of the object. So obviously this picture is simplified, but overall on average the energy balance of the Earth to recap is this. A 5,000 or so Kelvin sun with a spectrum peaked in the visible impinges on Earth with an intensity of about 230 watts per square meter. The Earth absorbs that and radiates at a power proportional to the fourth power of temperature, so that an equilibrium is established with an average Earth temperature of about 200 to 300 Kelvin. At equilibrium, if the temperature of the Earth is constant, what the Earth is essentially doing is taking the visible light from the sun and re-radiating it at lower frequencies, specifically frequencies in the infrared. The atmosphere being transparent means, of course, that it is transparent to visible light, but it can absorb other wavelengths outside the visible. In my last video, I concluded that infrared frequency photons match the energy of molecular vibration. So small molecules will certainly be absorbing this infrared radiation. That is, the atmosphere is partially opaque to micron wavelength infrared waves. The exact frequencies at which a molecule absorbs ultimately come from the atomic masses and strengths of bonds. And this is analogous to the way that the frequency of vibration of a classical spring depends on the elasticity of the spring and the mass. But we still have to remember basic physicality. We're using quantum mechanics to derive the frequencies of photons that a molecule can absorb. But we can't forget about the fundamental physical picture that the link between photon absorption and vibration is that there are charged particles in molecules, protons and electrons. Electromagnetic waves exert a force on those charges and they are physically set in motion. They start shaking. Of course, all matter contains charged particles, but most matter is neutral, having equal amounts of positive and negative charges, so forces cancel. Neutral matter can certainly still interact with electromagnetic fields, but there needs to be some separation of charge, some asymmetry for positive and negative charges to be acted on differently so that a net force can result. Separation of charge is what we call a dipole or a dipole moment. And we can understand the dipole properties of a molecule based on its symmetry. For example, O2, oxygen, a linear molecule with two oxygen atoms side by side is completely symmetric. This molecule has no dipole moment, no way for the electromagnetic field to act asymmetrically. Any interaction will cancel out because of the symmetric distribution of positive and negative charges. But take water, for instance, H2O which famously has a bent shape. The O, H, O are not arranged in a straight line, but are bent so that the O juts out. Now, oxygen has a greater electronegativity than hydrogen, so there's going to be more electron density concentrated around the oxygen. But in general, 
the fact that this molecule is atrometric allows for electromagnetic fields to exert some type of net force. So water, H2O, is readily capable of absorbing photons because of its built-in intrinsic dipole moment. And sure enough, although you hear lots about CO2, it turns out that good old familiar water is the primary greenhouse gas, the gas which makes the largest contribution to the greenhouse effect. Well, oxygen and similarly symmetric N2 are plentiful in the atmosphere. And you never hear about those contributing to the greenhouse effect, and their lack of dipole moment is why. Now, what about CO2? CO2 is a linear molecule, so the OCO are arranged in a straight line, meaning normally the molecule is symmetric and has no overall dipole moment. That's right. The scary CO2 that you hear about contributing to the greenhouse effect. The molecule probably most closely associated in popular imagination with climate change, CO2, has no dipole moment with which to absorb electromagnetic radiation. However, CO2, while being symmetric, is capable of undergoing an asymmetric mode of vibration. There's a state of vibration where one CO bond extends and contracts out of sync with the other one. And when these two bonds are vibrating out of sync, that creates an asymmetric distribution of charge, which allows the molecule to absorb photons. This is called an induced dipole, but it still means that CO2 is not as good at absorbing radiation as something like water, which has an intrinsic dipole.